here with you all today, and I was extremely excited when I was invited to come along and um, to talk to you about ecological research. I have an absolute passion for what I do, and I will just begin to say, if you don't take anything else away from my talk, to say that if someone had described to me the work that I now do, when I was at school, for instance, I would just thought, the absolute perfect profession. It is the most wonderful life, and I just feel very, very fortunate that every day I go and do work that I just love so much. So that's what I would like to probably leave you with, but of course have to be to show you um, first of all. So um, as there will be some overlap here with what Steve had to say, although our, our um, research expertise is very, is very different. Um, but that was me. I had quite exotic beginnings. My parents daringly took me um, to Uganda in, um, the, well, in 1970, which probably wasn't necessarily the best of times to be heading to Uganda. But my father was teaching maths and my mum was nursing. We arrived. There wasn't even a house built for us, but they just muddled through. And you can see I, I look very happy. And my dad has a romantic image that I was born to be an ecologist. He said, you know, they took me to this swamp and off I went. And um, he shares lots of memories of how much I enjoyed the wildlife we were there, sometimes too intimately. I had malaria a couple of times all about that. <coughs> that was a little bit too close to parasites, but I continue to enjoy parasites. I would really love to say, just as with Darwin, that I have an inordinate fondness um, for beetles from a very, very early age, but I, I think it would be unfair and say so, and it seemed to be the bananas were a large feature of my early years. But by the time I was uh, six, we were back in, in England, and um, I was very fortunate in remembering um, what has become the year of the ladybird, seven spot ladybirds in particular, with really high numbers. And I can remember at that age being in our back garden and seeing the ladybirds newly emerging from their pupil when they look very bright yellow, their spots and their colours haven't developed. And I just remember just finding that absolutely fascinating. And then I also remember my sister and I trying to teach the ladybirds to swim in our garden pond, which was less successful, but um, nevertheless an interesting way to spend some summer days. And I would say, just as Steve, I've been so fortunate in having inspiration from many, many different directions through, throughout my lifetime, and I continue to be inspired by many people that I meet and have the good fortune to, to work with. And um, my grandparents were a fantastic source of inspiration alongside my parents, and we spent a lot of time outside. And both my parents were working parents, and so I would be sent down to Cornwall for the summer months. I grew up largely on the Isle of Wight. I'd be sent down to Cornwall, and my grandmother was so patient as I slowly walked along the coastal paths, just looking at everything and turning everything over and rock falling. And, and um, she was just absolutely a great source of inspiration. And again, burnet moths on the Cornish coastal paths stick into my mind. So I remember seeing all these paper cocoons and thinking, what on earth are they? And there were no signs of the burnet moths. And then one day we saw the burnet moths emerging, and yeah, much to my delight. Um, the, the mystery of these pastry cocoons were solved. Then, um, growing up in the Isle of Wight, I became a member of the Natural History Society and had um, exciting times out small mammal trapping and also bat watching through my teenage years. My parents were quite protective, and I sometimes wonder whether I would have been quite such an um, enthusiastic bat watcher had it not allowed me to go to pubs with friends and um, sit there with a bat detector. I don't think my parents would have allowed me to do that otherwise. So I think there was something an ulterior motive there as well, but nevertheless, a um, great, great way to get into natural history. And my school was an inspiration. Every year, they took people who wanted to, and actually there were many of us, I would say, out to Newtown Nature Reserve on the Isle of Wight, where we got cut off by the water on a daily basis, and we camped, and we just did botanical surveys, bat surveys, uh, fresh water surveys. We had to row across this water and go and get fresh water to get over to the camp. And it was a fantastic experience, and again, a great source of inspiration. But again, I'd pick up on um, Steve's point about having to also be determined, because, so I was doing my A levels 25 years ago, which is since a bit too long ago, really. Um, but nevertheless, when I, I was doing physics, chemistry, and biology. And um, when I went to apply for Oxford and to do the physics entrance exam, my physics teacher refused to allow me to join the boys' group 
of extra lessons for physics because he said I was wasting my time, I'd be wasting his time because there was no point in girls doing physics. And I, I think you have to have a sense of determination. And what I used to do is the boys used to sneak out the papers for me so I could do them on my own. And I did get into Oxford and I did pass that physics exam. But you have to have that level of determination. I also knew that physics was a lot easier and a lot less interesting than biology anyway. So um, I kind of get that in my mind. And he spent for two years just calling me the girl, which was incredible. Thankfully, I hope that the females in the audience here now don't experience that, but I would say that determination is important, and, and that did give me a good lesson in determination. So I did a degree in biology, I then went into a master's at Nottingham University, and also my PhD was at Nottingham University linked with Rotherham Study Research, and I was down at Rotherham Study Research for much of that time. It was great being in a research environment, in that research institute environment. I have a passion for community ecology and my passion for ladybirds going back to 1976 continued and so I was very fortunate to have three years of a PhD <coughs> studying ladybird ecology and their interaction with a whole variety of other um, species that interact with aphids. And this little dull thing at the bottom here is an aphid specific pathogenic fungus <coughs> and um, it, it looks, and I would say this is a little bit dull, I actually think it's quite beautiful as well. But it, um, it's fascinating in terms of how it manipulates the behaviour of the aphids, and, and that gave me three years of fascination. <coughs> I then, straight away after completing my PhD, got a lectureship at Anglia Ruskin University, and I, I completed my PhD in three years, and in fact, I had a month left of my grant, which Nottingham University apparently couldn't take back, that didn't really normally happen. So I went off to Anglia Ruskin University, and I kind of at that point wished I'd taken another year to do my PhD, because going into a lectureship, straight away from a PhD was extremely hard work. Um, but I have to say, I had 10 years there and absolutely loved it. Took students out into the field as much as I possibly could and um, thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity of working alongside many young people. I have um, two children and I had my children while I was at Anglia Rusk University. In fact, as soon as I had arrived at the university, um, little Katie came along, not entirely prepared and planned for her, so the biologist probably should be better, but nevertheless, we were absolutely delighted di 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 to, to, to have her. And I asked her and, and my other daughter, so what is it like having a mum who's a, a full-time ecologist? And, and Ella said it's fun because she learns about the world of lady birds. And uh, Katie, age 14, has absolutely no comment on the matter, so <laughs> <laughs> So after 10 years at Anglia Ruskin University, I went to the Centre for College and Hydrology. I applied for a job there to, to lead the zoology side of things within the Biological Record Centre, which um, has long-term large-scale data sets, and um, was fortunate to get, to get the position, and reluctantly left the world of, the world of teaching, but also knew that there would be new opportunities, and I think it was about seizing opportunities, um, <coughs> new opportunities for me to develop my research, both in terms of the work that I was continuing to do on lady birth, but also in terms of um, work that I was beginning um, to lead on um, non-native species. I should also mention here, as well as being a paid ecologist, I also um, run the Ladybird Survey as a volunteer. And again, it's just a pleasure to do this. And I feed the, the data that comes through the Ladybird Survey does feed directly um, into my research. Um, but I find it a tremendous pleasure to, to, to run the survey and the diversity that, that brings to, to my work. So yes, a large part of what I do is just putting ladybirds on the map. But people send me in their occurrence records of where they see ladybirds. We get an awful lot of records and this makes a really valuable data set. And um, there are 47 species of ladybirds in Britain, in case, in case you were wondering. And um, we, we map all of them, and it allows us to do some really lovely um, large scale and long term <coughs> analyses. The harlequin ladybird was uh, a species that perhaps um, changed my career a little into two new directions. When the harlequin ladybird, a non native species, arrived in Britain in 2004. We saw the opportunity to launch an online survey, and it was one of the first online surveys um, for wildlife um, that there was. And we have gathered an enormous amount of data and have this unprecedented data set of an alien species. 
alongside all this data we have on native species allows us to look at um, the interactions between the two. And this is just to show you some of the work that we recently published. And also to bring out this importance of collaboration. This paper is working with colleagues from using data sets in Switzerland and Belgium, but working with colleagues across Europe. And we genuinely did sit together in a room with whiteboards, drawing up models on the blackboard and having um, the computers <coughs> going. And we had three two-day slots of time with one another to, to really progress this work. And that collaboration and that, that social side is also um, something I enjoy immensely and has been important. So the Harlequin Ladybird, my work is broadened out a lot and um, I lead work on alien species across Europe and just have a grant beginning for the next four years from Europe with a network of probably about 120 um, scientists that I will be leading over the next four years. And um, if you find a, a, a species that you're concerned about or would like to know more about, if you like the alien, you can email this email address, alert on school non-native, and um, I will find someone who will be able to tell you something about it. So this is now the um, system of surveillance that the government uses. So there's this big link between the research that I do and um, policy directions. It's likely to be a directive on alien species in the next, um, in the next year. So in terms of the opportunities at a research institute, and for example, the Centre for College and Hydrology, well, they're, they're far ranging. You could be a research ecologist um, as I am. You might be more interested in the project management side of things and directing um, large projects. And that does take some of my time as well now, but we do have people who are, who are there specifically for the project management. Some people for business development, looking for opportunities, looking for grants and um, opportunities that scientists might be able to use. Science communication is, is, a, a, is, a, is extremely important, and indeed so is science administration. So there's lots of different opportunities. And I just flicked onto the website yesterday to see what was there, and just to suggest if you're interested in a job at CH, then <coughs> those are the, the, the vacancies are advertised um, on the CEH website, so that's somewhere to take a look. I would say it's not brilliantly well paid, is it? That's probably one of the things you probably should have said, but thankfully yeah, I did not really that bothered about money, so it doesn't matter. Um, but most of the scientists at CH have either a master's degree or a PhD. This is one of my master's students from a couple of years ago, <coughs> doing some work on the Adonis green butterfly out in chalk grassland. So it was a fantastic, um, a fantastic project. And then just as also as to talk about my working environment, well, that's my office, and uh, you see that ladybirds take a fair amount of um, space in my office. And uh, this is the minister uh, Richard Benyon who came to to visit the institute, and as you can see, what we're telling him about ladybirds, and um, encouraging him to go out recording. But also, my working environment takes me to other places as well. And um, last year, I was fortunate to, to teach for the Tropical Biological Association, perhaps the year before now, and went to Kabali Forest in um, back to Uganda, which was fantastic for me to, to, to go back. And the Tropical Biological Association are advertising at the moment for their one-month courses in Uganda. This is um, the forest and um, doing some recordings. This is the first ever recording I did um, of my work for the BBC. This was for Radio 4 Living World, and I've had the, the enormous enjoyment and pleasure of doing a lot more since. It also takes me to visit schools and to talk about ladybirds and, and other things within schools. Part of my work environment is all these unusual working hours. So I think that's the other thing to accept that, and, and I, I agree with Steve, it's, it's a it is a vocation. You do have to put in a lot of time and be determined and, and enjoy what you're doing because otherwise I'm not really sure why, why you would do it. And in terms of what sort of skills are required, this is another of my last students from last year. Um, we were going out doing some tree beating and looking at um, colour pattern forms and pictures. You need to have enthusiasm. And I, I really believe that takes you a long, long way. If you're enthusiastic and passionate about what you're doing, that is going to get you a very, very long way. And that you'll recognize Olivia in um, this slide here, um, who is one of your um, organizers from today. And she was a master's student at CH last year. We had fantastic uh, master's students. And uh, we were out monitoring um, field margins on farming for insects. And it was a fantastic day, wasn't it? It was really good. So you need to have perseverance and determination. You need to be flexible. This is 
she sets up the Thai Academy for Bali for us. You need to be adaptable and just work with what you've got and the resources that you have and be prepared sometimes that things are going to be tougher than other times. It's important to work as a team and, and as Steve said, bring your unique qualities um, to that team, but work well with that team. Foster a real sense of collaboration and, and, and help bring on that whole team working um, together. And I've already mentioned, and I think that you'll be saying, of course, even more about this, the communication is enormously important. And uh, whether you're communicating via a blog, and this, Olivia contributed this blog um, um, after the Open Farm Sunday pollinator survey last year. Um, it's important to use lots of different formats. The ladybirds are on Twitter. And the ladybirds have about 1,300 followers. It's them, not me. They're definitely the most interesting part of our relationship. And uh, pretty much what I tweet about is ladybirds. And talk to a whole variety of audiences. Talk to scientists, talk to policy makers, talk to school children. <coughs> will listen to you about the work that you're doing and just infuse the next generation and your generation as well. But most of all, I think it is phenomenally important that you enjoy what you're doing and look for the enjoyment in it. If you're having a tough moment and a tough time, find what is it that I'm going to enjoy about this now that's going to see me through that bit. I think I've been relatively fortunate throughout my career that I generally just have had it quite easy in terms of enjoyment. And have fun, these are my, my two daughters having, having fun out and about. Sometimes I will say they, they question me and they'll say, please just walk somewhere and stop looking at things and just move. And so I won't always say it's fun to have, um, to have an ecologist as a mum, but <coughs> mostly they're very tolerant. They came with me this weekend so I had to be talk somewhere. And as I said right at the very beginning, it is the absolute most wonderful life. It is a fantastic career. If you're doing what you're enjoying doing and you're making a contribution to such important um, issues as um, Steve has already mentioned, I don't think there's any more of an important time to be an ecologist than there is now. So I invite you also to have a wonderful life being an ecologist. Thank you.